Good evening and welcome to the seminar. This meeting will be interpreted simultaneously into Spanish and any comments made in Spanish will be interpreted into English. To listen to the interpretation of the Spanish comments into English, please click on the globe icon at the bottom of the page and choose your language. Thank you so much. Muy buenas tardes y bienvenidos a la reunión. Esta reunión será interpretada al español simultáneamente. Para escuchar en español, por favor haga clic en el icono del globo que se encuentra al pie de la página y elija el idioma español. También puede hacer clic donde dice Mute Original Audio para escuchar solo la interpretación. Si quiere hacer un comentario o una pregunta, puede hacerla y nosotros se la interpretaremos al inglés. Muchas gracias. And if you would like to speak during public comment, please use the raise hand function at the bottom of your screen. When it is your turn to speak, a panelist will provide speaking access to you. You will then receive a notification to unmute yourself. At that point, please unmute your microphone and proceed with your comment. And after you have provided your comment, your speaking capabilities will be disabled. Thank you. Okay, are we ready to start? I will call the meeting to order. It is Monday, August 23rd. Um, this is the Sonoma County Advisory Redistricting Commission. I'm calling this meeting to order. Welcome everyone and welcome commissioners. Um, and as always, thank you all for your commitment to this very important process. Um, this is the third meeting of this commission. As you are aware, today's meeting is a public hearing and you'll notice that the agenda is different from previous meetings. Um, so before we get underway, I do want to reaffirm to commissioners and um, state to the public that this is the first time the county has assembled a commission to oversee the redistricting process. So this is all new to us. Um, in a sense, we are chartering unmapped territory, pun intended. Um, I ask that we all commissioners remain grounded in our mission, that the Board of Supervisors established this commission to advise and assist the board with redrawing of our district boundaries. This is our purpose, and this is an our process. Um, we have been selected by the supervisors because of our connectedness with the community. Our objective is to oversee a public process that is inclusive, and will allow for the development of supervisorial district boundaries that respect our neighborhoods, our demographics, our history, our geography, and other unique elements that are characteristic of our county. Um, okay, the last thing I wanna say before we get underway is that at our previous two meetings, um, we have gone well over the schedule time. So I ask all of you commissioners, please be mindful of the agenda. Um, and that's it. I'm going to launch right into agenda item number two, the public hearing. We will begin with a presentation from Shalice and then we'll open the public hearing. Good evening and um, welcome to our first official public hearing. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. The redistricting process um, involves some mandated hearings and the county chose to have additional hearings by appointing this advisory uh, commission. So as you're seeing on, on the um, timeline, this is page one of the timeline, we've already had two meetings with the commission, our initial meeting, and then of course, um, a workshop to discuss communities of interest and mapping tools. And tonight will be very much the same as July 26. However, it's going to be marked in the books as our official hearing to receive input on communities of interest as required by the Fair Maps Act. So after I go through the presentation, we are truly hoping to hear from the commission and to hear from members of the public actually speaking to and identifying neighborhoods, identifying communities of interest, 
those areas that should be kept together in a single district for their representation, and maybe some areas that would benefit from multiple, rep multiple representation. On September 1st, we're going to have a special um, meeting. It, this will just focus on training. So tonight, I'm just going to briefly give you an overview of the mapping tools. If you are interested in wanting to do some more um, in-depth training on the mapping tools, I encourage you to join that September 1st meeting. I believe uh, Yvonne, is, I, is it at six o'clock? I can't, can't remember the time that we set for that. So I know it's on the website, we can look at it. It's at four o'clock. It's at four o'clock, okay. And it will be taped. So those who miss it, you'll be able to come back and, and revisit it. We're hoping after um, September 1st, the public will feel um, empowered to start working on maps. We're wanting to get draft maps in as soon as possible. And we understand that we're using estimated population data because although the Census Bureau released numbers on August 12th, that data is in legacy format and must be reformatted. They're likely getting close to being done with that, if not done, and then the, uh, the state and it's the California statewide database that is the um, agency that's charged with doing this. They need to zero out all the state prisons and reassign those incarcerated persons to their last known home address. Then they will release those numbers to us and then there will be a mandated, uh, at least a one week mandated waiting period uh, before uh, we as consultants or the county can, can release any drop maps. We'll be coming back uh, to the Board of Supervisors on October 5th to review that 2020 data and compare it to the existing districts to see how we are as far as population balance. We have two dates for the public to, admit, to submit maps. Um, we're hoping to encourage uh, those to, that are able to meet that October 8th deadline to get those in as uh, uh, to, get, to get them in by October 8th. That ensures that I'm going to be able to get those, we're all gonna be able to get those maps done for discussion on October 18th. But we realized as per the last meeting that the commission wanted to give the public more time. So we've added a second submission deadline of October 15th. The October 15th deadline, as you can see, there would only be a, a, basically a 48 hour turnaround to get them in time for the October 18th meeting. So. If you want to, if you want your maps discussed on, on the 18th, try to get them in by October 8th. Um, otherwise, the, your map would be discussed on the October 22nd meeting. Then we'll have another meeting on October 25th. By October 25th, we're hoping that this commission can narrow it, identify two to three focus maps to present to the Board of Supervisors. They will have their second official hearing on November 2nd and give direction on any map modifications to those focus maps that the commission has submitted. On November 16th, we're anticipating that the Board of Supervisors will hold its third meeting to identify their preferred map, and of course, provide any direction on any map modifications with looking to introduce the ordinance to adopt on December 7th, with final adoption on December 14th. I do wanna mention, and Yvonne, this is pretty new news to you too, at the uh, legislation that's going through the state legislature right now to uh, revive, re to change the requirement that we um, possibly can adopt by resolution has um, received new life. <laughs> and so it could be possible we're able to adopt by resolution. So um, we're still, it still has not been passed yet, but it's going forward and, and at one point it was dead. So. It's possible that the, the Board of Supervisors may be able to adopt by resolution and avoid having to have that second reading, but um, we'll need to, to visit that because it may need to be, existing ordinance may need to be revised to allow, um, to allow adoption by resolution, but that would certainly give the board more time. There are rules that we must follow when we are creating the districts, the federal laws, equal population based on the federal census. And then California has added their requirement that the uh, state prisons be zeroed out and those prisoners be reassigned to their home location. When we're talking equal population, we're talking all people. So that would include uh, those who are US citizens and those who are non-citizens. 
also includes um, babies, every, every, every person of all age living within the county boundaries. When we're talking equal population, it doesn't have to be exactly equal, uh, exact population for each of the five districts. There can be a slight deviation, but it can be no greater than a 10% deviation between the, the least populated district and the, the greatest population district of the five. We're talking about Federal Voting Rights Act. Federal Voting Rights Act, um, it, most common think of um, cracking and packing meaning if you have a geographically concentrated area of a protected class group, you cannot um, divide that group in a way that they would be split into several different districts so that it would dilute their power. Additionally, you, if you had a high, uh, large concentrated area of a protected class group, you can't draw a district to, to, uh, for purposes of, of including them or packing them all in one district so they have no effectiveness in any other district. Also, there can be no racial gerrymandering, meaning that lines can't be drawn solely for the purpose of including a particular race. It can be one fact factor, but it cannot be the only factor. So instead, you need to uh, look at things like um, shared culture, cultural interests, shared social networks, um, shared language spoken at home, shared history, those type of things in addition to race. The second column relates to the Fair Maps Act. The Fair Maps Act, uh, beginning in January of 2020, has pr prioritized the criteria that must be used when we are drawing boundaries. So even when we're looking at the existing map, we'll we need to run it past this test to see if, if, if for some reason, if, if the commission were interested in starting with the existing boundaries, we would, for example, want to um, to run this test against the existing boundaries to see if these prioritized criteria are met. The first one is geographically contiguous. So in most cases, one single border per single district. Undivided neighborhoods and communities of interest. Again, these are geographically concentrated areas that should be kept together. And those would be uh, neighborhoods that share the same socioeconomic interests or, or other shared interests. The third, priority is keeping cities and census designated places intact as much as practical, practicable. The fourth is easily identifiable boundaries. That's, uh, think of it if you're able to verbally describe your neighborhood and it would be understandable to someone, that's kind of a good measure for that. Uh, often that times that means following major roadways, uh, railroads, uh, rivers, natural landmarks. The fifth is compactness. We're com talking about compactness. We're not necessarily talking about the size or shape, actually. We're talking about not pass bypassing one group of people to get to a more distant group of people. And it's prohibited to uh, draw boundaries to favor or discriminate against a political party. Once we've met these criteria, then we can look at others, uh, minimizing those voters that are shifted from a, 2020, a 2022 year to a 2024 year. Also, we can look at uh, respecting voters' choices and avoid pairing incumbents. If all things being equal, we've met all the prioritized criteria and it's possible to draw boundaries to avoid head-to-head -head, uh, uh, contests between incumbents, then we'll present that option. We can, can consider future population growth, but that needs to be, again, within the, the uh, overall 10% deviation. So you could possibly underpopulate an area that you anticipate there will be growth. And then another tradition, another criteria we could consider is preserving the core uh, of the existing districts. On your screen, I'm showing you now the um, existing uh, districts compared to our 2020 NDC estimated population. So uh, the top line is total population. We believe there's going to be about uh, just short of 500,000 in the county. And um, with that, if you divide it by five, about, about 100,000 um, people in each of the five districts. And then when you look at citizen voting age population, that's an important category. That category is the, are those uh, people who are 18 years of age and eligible to vote. So this is often the category the, that uh, the folks will look at as far as the Federal Voting Rights Act to see how good of a job um, 
the, the map does if there are geographically concentrated areas by keeping those geographically uh, concentrated areas together. So you would see, uh, for example, higher percentages in one of the um, protected class groups, if, if it's possible to do so. Not every um, jurisdiction is able to have, is, it has highly concentrated areas, but um, there are certainly some pockets in the county. After uh, I go through the map questions, we're gonna want to ask, what is your neighborhood? What, and more importantly, what are the most, or equally importantly, what are the geographical boundaries? Because we need to translate that to a map. So as you're speaking, it would be very helpful if you describe the geographical boundaries or if you describe certain areas that, that should belong with one another. In addition to neighborhoods, also communities of interest, Again, they have to be a geographical area, but areas that share a common issue or characteristic. Um, sometimes there are social or economic interests and concerns. Sometimes there's uh, county, some, some areas are impacted by county policies. Oftentimes you think of fire safety, flood safety, um, traffic, um, health concerns, environmental concerns, home, um, housing concerns. These are, these are things that, that oftentimes will bring a community together. And then the next question, would that community benefit from being included in a single district or would it benefit by having multiple representatives, meaning that um, that district would, uh, part would be in, in, in one supervisorial uh, district and another would be in another supervisorial wow. district. Now let's get to the mapping tools. I'm gonna to go very quickly through these mapping tools. I'm gonna to, to jump to the website so that you can see them from the website. Just showing you here, we have different tools for different purposes and different levels of skill. We have uh, just an interactive review map, which is a simple tool where you can just um, look at the existing districts. You can look at maps as they come in, they'll be posted on there. You can even overlay maps one on top of another and look at, bring up other, um, other maps that are available that, that depict features of the county. We have a paper-based draw a map, um, draft map tool, and that's for those who don't want to use the computer. So they can pick up, get a print, print a PDF from the website or pick one up at, at um, county offices and draw a map just using the paper toolkit. Along with that paper toolkit, you don't need to use it, but we do have an Excel sheet if you want Excel to do the math for you and to add the total population as well as give you information on the citizen voting age population for each of those categories that I had listed. We have District R, which is a paintbrush tool. So you um, can just use the paintbrush to draw the districts, give you a count, and then we have our most powerful caliper mapitude online, which is an online mapping tool. Uh, I'm going to quick, quickly show you these screens, just they're in the PowerPoint. So for those who want to revisit this and PowerPoint has links, but um, I do want to jump and have and access it from the website so you can see how, uh, how to get to these maps and, and where you can find them. Do you want to mention that any maps that are submitted will be professionally produced by NDC for public review? So uh, every map will all, all maps will be treated equally, whether they were submitted on a cocktail napkin or whether they were submitted electronically using one of the fancy tools. So all the maps will be professionally produced and, so that the commission can, um, can evaluate them equally. They will each come also with a set of demographic, uh, with a demographic summary. I know that the writing is small on here, but in the demographic summary, it gives you the total population and then also the citizen voting age population, some voter registration, and voter turnout information. And then we have the socioeconomic information such as uh, immigration status, language spoken at home, language fluency. And we're giving the, the proportions for each of the, of the five districts. And this will be for every map. Again, this is these uh, socioeconomic categories are to help to see how good of a job that particular map is done at keeping a particular community of interest together. The first map we have is story map. A story map, well, you can just scroll through a series of maps. This one happens to be the current districts, districts but then you can also see there are other categories um, such as showing you where the census tracts are, the census block groups, 
the cities and designated places are, are actually um, highlighted in red on here. But this is this is interesting. This is not a map drawing tool, but it's just used perhaps to identify communities of interest. We have the online interactive review map that I mentioned. This map is going to be very, we're going to use it often when we have the maps that are submitted because they will all be listed here as well. Here's a snapshot of our paper toolkit and you can see that each of these areas are drawn, uh, these, these are following, these geographical units are the census tracts is is what we're using for this particular map and it gives a population count for each of the census tracts so one could just take this map and draw solid lines along the boundaries to get total population about 99,954 for each of the five districts and then the excel spreadsheet if you um, want to have excel do the math for you there's a similar map uh, only this map, instead of having population in each of the population units, they're numbered consecutively, one through one through 90, I believe, one through perhaps 70. Um, that, and then you open up the spreadsheet, and if you've assigned, for example, your districts one through 30 to your district two, then you would assign population units one through 30 to district two. Uh, district R is our what I call a paintbrush tool, because that's exactly how you use it. You, you select the paintbrush and you start coloring in with the paintbrush. I'm going to show you that one later, uh, next. And then calipers is our most powerful online mapping tool. So I'm going to go ahead and switch to some of the tools right now. Give me just a second here. Bear with me. This gets a little difficult because my screen is covered up by my menu. <laughs> First thing I want to show you is the interactive map tool. Um, let's go to the website first. The website, um, when you log into SonomaCounty.ca.gov. It's actually under the County Administrator's Office under Policy Grants and Special Projects. But we do have um, a shortcut feature to that that I um, showed you on the screen, and I will. I want to make sure I get it right, so I'm not going to tell you what that is. I usually just actually just get to the screen by this screen by typing Sonoma County Redistricting, and it gets you to this to this particular screen. Um, but on our on the slides, I have the um, the address for the website. Here um, we have the uh, draw a map. Actually, when you get to the website, you're at this gives a little background about um, redistricting, and then get down to the draw a map and click on learn more, and then all of the mapping tools will show up. I'll come back and show you the paper maps and then district R and calipers. I'm going to jump down and start with the interactive review, review map. So I think that one's going to be uh, most interesting uh, and relevant as we go through the others. It's good to know it's there. This is the um, interactive review map. And again, this is not a map drawing tool. But this is a good one to be able to zoom in very closely and see actually you can get very close and get actually down to street names. Um, you just click on what you like highlighted right now. The things that I have highlighted are the current districts in color. If they weren't in color, they're just in these dotted lines. These are, this one is the dotted line. And then I've also high, high, highlighted the, um, the count the uh, cities and other areas in the uh, county the census areas. And what's nice about this, as I said, is be able to zoom in very closely. So if you're wondering how, exactly how Santa Rosa is divided. And actually, there was a question early, along, early, early on about Roner Park being divided. 
So you can see here's Roanoke Park. Here's the area that's in one district and here's the area in another district. Oops, I'm sorry. So I get more closely as, as you get closer and closer and you can see um, the street names. Another very interesting thing about this is um, when I click on the census blocks, it shows me the population of each of the census blocks. And the reason why I wanted to show this to you is because it's important for a couple of reasons. One, we must follow the census block geography. So you can see sometimes census blocks have very odd shape. They have a very long shape. Are you able to, can someone verbally tell me if you could able to see my cursor as I move around? Yes. yes. Okay. So you can see over here, this is, this is a very long census block. This is an odd shaped one. And sometimes the census blocks don't really do a good job because the folks who live on this side of Dexter are in this long, odd shaped one, and the ones that live inside are in another one. So it's kind of a, a, an odd shape. Census blocks doesn't do a good job with cold to sexes, guess what I'm saying. Davis Circle is right here. This is in Rona Park. Um, the insides are uh, those people on one side of the street are in one census block, and the other, they're in this very large one. So this is going to be important because when you're drawing your maps, say you are just trying to pick up um, maybe just this area, it would pick up. If you touch the census block when you're drawing the map, it's going to highlight the whole census block. So that, that's just good information to know when you're drawing the maps. Because sometimes you're drawing a line and you want it to be exactly to follow maybe this this straight all the way over it, well, it's gonna highlight the whole census block because you can't divide the census block. I wanted to show you that. I also wanted to show you um, this tool, this interactive review map tool is also used when you're looking at total populations. So I'm going to click this. This, is the, this goes along with the paper map. So rather than have all of those small numbers that we saw with the census block, let me zoom out a little bit. This is where we've divided them um, into by census tract and given the population totals. Because when you're talking 100,000, you want to definitely be adding bigger numbers. But where this is useful is say um, you didn't particularly like how we drew a particular uh, population unit and you wanted your population unit to uh, follow something different. Say, for example, this, this particular census tract takes in part of Roner Park. So you could, um, when you're doing the paper map, if you did not want to follow the geography that we use for these um, population units, then you could um, just say, I want you know, all of the boundary of Roner Park to be on my map in, this, in one particular district. Okay, so I'm going, we're going to leave that, go back to our website. The first on here are the, the paper kits. Let me go ahead and bring up the paper kit. Can you see my screen at the paper kit is on there? Or do I need to a new share? We cannot see it, so you'll need to do a new share. There we go. Okay. All right, so this is the, what the paper kit looks like similar to what I just showed you on the screen, um, but this is the paper map that you pick up because this particular area in Santa Rosa is very congested. We've done a pop out of it. But this is one where you can just take a marker and draw what boundaries you want in a particular district. You can do the math yourself and just submit the colored maps. Just make sure that we can see where your line is. Let me bring up the... Um, the paper kit by unit number. So those are population counts. You can see this map looks the same, but they're all numbered consecutive. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. And then if you wanted, uh, so you would use this map if you've drawn your map, but you want Excel to do the sheet. 
So say this is going to be my district one over here. I would go to my Excel spreadsheet and I would assign um, those two district, district one. My population units are on the left hand side. I can make that a bit bigger so you can see that a little bit better. So, so we, you have yeah. the Excel open and you wanted them to see it. We currently only see the PDF of the map. Thanks. This is the Excel spreadsheet. And what I've done is I noted that when I drew my map, my population that were unit numbers that were numbered one through nine, I drew in my district one. So I assigned district one to all of those. Just say, just for kicks, that I drew a map, everything just happened to line up, and population units 10 through 15 were in my district two. Let's go a little bit more. And then you build out your entire map. Now, they're not going to go exactly in that perfect order, but I want to show, just demonstrate you how you can see your results by clicking on the results page here. I've only drawn two districts. Um, my first district is uh, very short because that was not a very populated area. It only has 14,000 people in it. My second district only has 16,731 people in it. But you can see where it's done the math for me. It actually is telling me you need 85,544 more for District 1 and 83,223 more for District 2. But um, And then, then it will show you the... Uh, the population total totals the for citizen voting age population. So I have 7% Hispanic in District 1 and 6% Hispanic in District 2. Once you build out your entire map, all of these figures will be populated. And you can actually just send in this um, spreadsheet um, once you are have your map completed. <coughs> Excuse me. Let me get back to the website. <clears throat> so that covers your paper maps. I want to show you District R. Can you let me know if it did, does it say tag Sonoma on your screen? Yes, it does. Okay. So Taxonoma County, this is important, and I, I, we've set it up, I believe, so it automatically does this for you. Normally, I'll ask you to tag it, but I, 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 we have set this up so it will tag Sonoma. So all of the Sonoma County maps will be grouped together when we go to um, get them towards the end of the map drawing process. You can do it one of two ways. You can just identify a particular single community, or you can build all of the five supervisorial districts. I'm going to go ahead and click the five supervisorial districts. I usually use this, this one as opposed to identify a single one because inevitably you draw one community, you want to draw another one. You're not bound to draw all five maps, but it gives you the option to. On the screen, it's showing me that my ideal population is uh, nine, 99,954. You can also, once you've drawn, you can also compare your percentages of your citizen voting age population. And you can also uh, highlight additional demographics on here. This is happening in the show, the darker is the, the areas that have children at home, income over 75K, Spanish spoken, spoken at home, these are different things to help you when you're drawing your map that identify communities of interest. Right now, I'm going to undo that feature just so our map is a little bit less crowded. And let's go ahead and zoom in a little bit more closely to perhaps maybe the south end of the county. And let's try, start drawing a district. You highlight the paintbrush. This right here tells you how wide your paintbrush is going to be. Select my color, select how wide it is. And let me show the population uh, screen because as I start to color, 
you can see that population is starting to grow. And maybe I want to make my paintbrush just a little bit smaller now that I'm getting close to um, more population. A little bit more too. Maybe some of Rona Park here. Oh, sure, I got way too many. I had a little. <laughs> um, little glitch there <laughs> with, with my uh, cursor. But you can see I, I'm, I'm over the population 8.59%. 8. 8. I probably don't wanna get that high, although it's within the 10, but that means all the other districts have to be perfect. Let me click on the eraser, just erase them out of here, this highly populated area. Now I'm at 95. You get the point, um, and you, you, then you would simply go to your paintbrush and draw your next district. I'm gonna lock what I already have so I don't mess up my perfect district here. So this is, this is a very simple way of doing it, but uh, you get the idea. I'll fill them in here. Oh. And then your next district. And then you save it. What you'll want to do is if you want to um, copy, you want to copy this URL if you want to go back and keep working on it. Um, <clears throat> but I, I, you, I I need to get the answer to this. I'm not sure how long that link stays active, um, but you can close this window and work on it, but you need to uh, copy the, the URL. From here, you want to name your plan just so that it's identifiable. You can choose whatever uh, name you want on here, but it, and if you choose to share it to the gallery, then others can see your plan. I'm not going to um, submit because uh, I don't want it this plan to be considered. And Sh Shalise, just real quick, you can zoom in on here, which is really kind of neat because then you could see your geographic boundaries that you really want to, you know, finesse around. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, zoom. Just click and drag so you can see. You'll really want to refine these areas, you know, choose this is kind of a fun tool, actually. It's it's new this year. It's um, it's simple on its face. It's really complicated on the back end. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, it's 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 a great tool. People are liking using it. It's a, I like it. Just you know, start using it just to get an idea of your map, and then once you you if you feel comfortable, use the um, the fancier tool to help hone in on it. Okay. Go ahead and just leave this tool. See if I can go back to the website from here. <clears throat> and then the last tool I want to show you is the um, this, the Maptitude online for redistricting. And again, um, if you're interested in a little, go, us going a little slower and um, showing showing you more um, information, join us on September first or watch the video from September first. Right now, I'm creating a new map. I'm using um, existing districts as my starting point. I could I could have started with a blank map. Instead, I'm using existing districts. We say that I I did want to. Um, I'm going to change so I can see the colors of my districts here. I just changed my theme to show districts so that I could see the colors. And when we on September 1st, I'll be showing you how to do more of this. There's a tutorial online that's very useful. There's also tips and the help screen that will walk you through each of the features on here. So um, there's a tutorial, there's tips, there's this help feature, and there's a, a 
video and you can join us on September 1st or you can um, uh, watch the video of September 1st to learn more about it. So say that you wanted to um, add to District 3 and take from District 4. This is where you'd say, okay, I'm going to um, add to District 3. That's going to be my target. I'm going to take from District 4. And say I wanted to, um, oh, I'm sorry, I'm going to take from District 2. So for example, if I wanted to um, take all of this area right here, I'm going to choose my selection area is going to be block. That's the smallest, as you'll recall, that I can choose. And I could go one block at a time. It's again highlighting the, the census block, or I can use the free form. I will go all the way down to here. And it highlights all of it. Here is telling me what my change is. So that was a total of 682 people that were affected. I'm adding 682 to area three. I'm taking 682 from area two. My percent deviation is uh, going to be just 1.5% over the ideal in district three and that's just 2% under in District 2. So this looks good. I'm gonna go ahead and do the check mark. If I want my colors to come back, I'm just gonna clear out these, um, those specific selections and then my colors come back on my map. We're going to go into greater detail on September 1st on how you can start with a blank map. And for example, you can just highlight an entire um, city. So going back to you know our early suggestion of all of Roanoke Park being in one district, you could um, I'll, I'll be showing you on uh, September first how you can go in and just select one city or capture every section of that particular city. Oops, let's go back to our, our home screen. So once you, once you are done with your map and you like your, the changes that you made, I know I realized that was a very small change. You can, you can check it, your plan integrity to your unassigned areas. There are no unassigned areas. We did good. Find if there's any non-contiguous di districts. There is a non-contiguous district in area two. So let's look at it. So it looks like I just missed one. It's gonna give me my suggestion that I take from there and move it to there. So we'll do just that. Let me go here. And that should have resolved my um, area. Once you're all done, there's two things you can do. You can share your plan. You can name it, whatever you want. You can share it with the community. So when others go to open up the screen, you'll see that there, are, there will be plans listed of plans that people have shared. And then a separate action is submitting the plan. So once you have your, um, I don't uh, wanna share it. <laughs> once you have your plan done, then you can you submit your plan. You'll have the opportunity to uh, put your name and your address and your telephone. And this is this will be really helpful for us. Sometimes plans are submitted and there's just that there will be like an unassigned area or something will be just slightly out of population balance. And if we have this contact information, then we're able to contact you and, and maybe ask if you're willing to just make a change to this population balance so it's a legal map or if there's some, another issue that we can help help you with. <clears throat> Or you can choose not to and your map would be submitted and it would just say it's, it's legally non-conforming because of whatever problem it has. We ask that you provide a description that's very helpful. So for example, if you only know one particular area very well and that's where you concentrated, 
we'd like to hear that. So say if you were very familiar with um, you know, Petaluma and you concentrated mostly on the on that district and the area that that city and the areas around it, then you can write that and you say, I was not that familiar with, you know, North County and um, so I just population balance. That's how hel that's helpful for us so that when we're looking at the maps, because sometimes the commission will want will really like how one district is drawn in one map and how another district is on another map and we can kind of, we can mix and match. So that is the, um, the mapping tool, the uh, calipers online. I'm going to go back to our uh, go back to our PowerPoint. Here is the website: sonomacounty.ca.gov forward slash redistricting. So that will give you at the start the place where you can just scroll down and see and uh, get you the draw map and draw all of the tools. And with that, that concludes my presentation. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions and uh, hopefully we're, we have members of the public who are interested and able to give us feedback on neighborhoods and communities of interest. All right, thank you, um, Shalise. Um, we're opening the public hearing, so we are um, looking at the time at 7.02, opening it up for um, comments from the public. At this time, do we have members of the community who would like to comment? Um, comments on redistricting, communities of interest, the mapping tool, the process, opening it up to the public first. Yes, yeah, so our first, um individual who would like to uh, speak is Tamara Chapman Davis. So I'm going to go ahead and have my colleague go ahead and promote her to a panelist. You should go ahead and see um, a request to access your camera and microphone and you should be able to speak to the commission. Okay, I'm not on the Oh, oh there's, there's a picture and not the camera. Uh, okay, I'm Tamara Davis. I live in Robert Park. And uh, I think all of this map drawing equipment is really fascinating. But for me, and forgive me if this has already been provided and I just didn't see it, I'd like to see a breakdown by each district of the population, which said how much of the population was the county and how much of the population was each city in each district. Um, I hope I'm being clear on that. So that it, I found this in the past when I've sat in on these meetings, It'd be very helpful for me to understand. Uh, Typically, four of our districts have a lot of Santa Rosa and only one of them doesn't. And that's been helpful for me to see that. So um, that's, that's my comment. I'd like to see that provided for all of us in the public. And, and Chair, I can make a list of questions and then answer them after if that's... Um... After, okay, that's, that's great. Thank you. Um, other comments from the public? Perfect. Our next one is from um, Fred Alabach. Um, Alabach. Uh, thank you. Uh, good evening, commissioners and uh, staff. Um, I've got a bunch of comments. I don't know how much time I have, but uh, this looks super fun. And but it occurs to me that I would really need like a whole class and a lot of practice to be able to master this and, and to have some level of competency. I think there's too many details. And from what I see of the public, people can barely show up for other important things. I have no idea how people are going to master this level of detail. So I think that the, the public needs options. For maybe the idea is that the, this commission produces the options and then the public looks at them. Um, but um, I think that uh, you need to have a professional demographer produce a big set of options as well. Um, based upon criteria. You tell the demographer the criteria, they make the maps rather than making people who don't know anything about this fumble through all these colors and charts. It's, it looks fun, but um, I think it's going to be a high tech wreck for the public. Uh, for communities of interest, um, I would like to note the springs in Sonoma Valley, where there's many disadvantaged community census tracks, blocks, census areas and they have Mississippi level poverty right next to opulent wealth, but I don't know how you could draw a map that would fix that. Um, let's see. I also, um, 
let's see. I, I see that the current county district sort of has an idea that that I had is that you as you make Santa Rosa kind of the center and then you have five districts stemming out from that. Um, I know that supervisors avoid uh, city politics like the plague, so that if you have a, a soup, whoever's the supervisor of Santa Rosa or Roner Park, I, I don't know what they do compared to a supervisor who has a, a lot less city for them. Um, and there's a lot of interesting points with this, um, but I would like to see uh, maps drawn that would empower um, the lower income disadvantaged communities of the county so that they would get be able to elect a representative somehow. I think uh, Socorro Shields might remember when she was superintendent of uh, Sonoma Valley School District that the districts here produced some options where there was one district you could choose that had a slight Latino majority and that was the one that the school district chose. So I would like to see something like that happen. Um, Let's see, and it and also occurs to me, I just read Ta-Nehisi Coates' book, Between the World and Me, and I see these census categories of white, Hispanic, and I just wonder, you know, how meaningful those categories are. Um, that seems to me to be sort of like fantasy gerrymandering based upon, you know, criteria that, that maybe we don't want to have these days. So I don't know why we have to have white, like white is not a country in Europe that people came from um, or is Hispanic. So are, are people who speak Spanish. So then do we call like people Anglos, anybody who speaks English? So I just question those categories a little bit. Um, let me see here. And then um, I had an idea that maybe we wouldn't have any districts at all and have at large elections so that um, all the population of the county would be able to vote. And then maybe um, that could give power to underrepresented, but I don't know, you know, that's, that certainly has problems to have at large elections because districts are supposed to cure that. But in the district where I live in Sonoma Valley, it seems like it's just sort of like a fiefdom. You have one supervisor, none of the other supervisors will touch touch another person's district. So it seems to me that there's something wrong with, with the district system as well as that you kind of enshrine a royalty for a particular area. So I, I don't know how you can draw a map to fix those kind of things, but um, those are some of my concerns and I will be writing these up so I could express them a little Great. better than I am now. Thanks a lot. All right, thank you, Fred. I'm a Ta-Nehisi Coates fan, so thank you so much. Um, do we have more comments from the public? Yes, we do. Our next individual is ZG, so we'll go ahead and, and uh, promote them now. All right, so sorry, Perfect. Emily. Yeah. Hey, everyone. My name is Zara Garcia. I'm currently a resident in Petaluma. Uh, this is actually a really great tool. So I applaud the uh, uh, the tools that we're using and for the commissioners to to get a hold of. Uh, one of my concerns and questions is, is how are you doing public outreach? Um, I know Fred actually spoke about our under uh, um, just with with outreach in terms of um, are you going, how are like the Latinx community going to receive these, these information? I mean, I'm fortunate enough to be able to know what's going on based on social media, based on obviously connections that I have um, within friends and just letting me know, hey, this is happening. So just more, more outreach, I think is one of my concerns just because Petaluma in itself is already lacking on outreach for our Latinx community. And so that's just something that I wanted to bring up uh, as well as like the demographics uh, I've noticed on the map, and I don't know, maybe it's because it's not the screen, but I know there's like a population within the Latinx, uh, the AAPI community, but wondering where the Black community comes in and if that's going to also be highlighted. So I just wanted to, to be mindful with that. Um, but also, I uh, won't take too much of your time. Appreciate what y'all are doing. And thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, more comments? So I am looking at our attendees now and I do not see any additional hand raise. 
Um, I am also looking at our Q and A's and I do not see um, any current questions that are open. Um, I know that we did have a question come in earlier that did ask um, if the recording would be available um, on the website. Uh, I did answer them back, but I just wanted to you know, state here, yes, the recording um, will be available on the website along with all the other meeting materials. Um, and with that, it looks like there are no other comments or questions. All right. Um, well, thank you, Emily. Um, without any more comments from the community, we will close the public hearing um, and come back to the commissioners. Uh, commissioners, do you, you have any clarifying questions or comments on the redistricting criteria, communities of interest, and mapping criteria and boundaries. Just um, yeah, raise your hand. I, I think I can see everybody here. Use the hand raise tool if I don't. Um, we will start with, it looks like Jeff. I see your hand up first. Thanks. Um, yeah, I had a question, um, and I'm not sure who would answer this, but uh, I, I had the opportunity to sit down with uh, Devin Reproto, the county assessor, recorder and register our voters. Um, and one thing that she brought to my attention, which was interesting was that um, the way the census works is basically they count who's where at what time period, whatever day they knock on your door, that's who they, that's how they count, right? If there's four people there living at that house that day. Um, so my concern, especially with our community, and this is something we probably never um, had to uh, consider before is what about um, the, uh, uh, the fire affected areas. So specifically the glass fire and fountain grove that could have thousands of people that are no longer living there, but that's their permanent address. And they get to be spread literally across the country. So how are we to take that into account if we take that into account at all? And could the, the, the deviation in that population be a problem later on? Um, I don't know, just an open question. I'm not sure um, what the answer is. Okay, and I can, uh, uh, Chair, would you like me to go ahead and yes, keep please. the list of <laughs> list of questions until- Thank you, uh, field, field these as, as, as um, they, they come. Um, you oh, have okay. the expertise here, so please. Okay, so for, uh, we're bound to use the California prisoner adjusted census data. We, we cannot um, make adjustments because we know particular circumstance such as, <clears throat> as what you mentioned with the glass fire. Uh, we do is have a little bit of leeway in that we could underpopulate that district, knowing that that district is going to grow when people rebuild and move back. Um, but we cannot deviate from the from the census numbers as presented to us. The law actually spells it out. Okay, looks like um, Rocio, you have your <clears throat> hand raised. I think Mike, you're you're on deck. Go ahead, Rocio. Thanks. My internet is slowing down a little bit, so let me know if uh, my question questions break up. Um, the first one that I had was if there is a key available for the maps for the acronyms that are located. That's one uh, for the acronyms that are in the map. That's one question. And the second question is: I think I heard that there are paper maps available in the county. Uh, and where should people go to get them? And I guess the quality of the maps, how, how detailed are they? If, if so, if I did hear that correctly. Very good question. Do we have, so, uh, Yvonne, do you, the, at least as far as maps, paper maps, the, the mapping kit, um, if we're not able to access information online, um, can we get um, these map kits? We, and we know we can get them at the county. Can we grab them and distribute them for, for other folks? Is that something that can be done? Yeah, so we don't have them produced yet, but I plan to. And so if the commissioners could just let me know quantity wise, how many, how many they're thinking, and I'll have to actually take a look at when they're printed on eight and a half by 11, if that's going to be adequate or if it needs to be a larger format given the given the, the map detail. And in any sense of when um, they might be available? Oh, well, as long, as long as I get an estimate, I, I should be able okay. to use them fairly quickly, yeah. Perfect, perfect. And, and Mike, Mike Martini? 
So one of the, the questions that have come up a number of times is I've done some outreach and meeting with groups. And in one sense, it's not really that important because we're going to get the data to work with from the state. But the uh, what is the origin of the estimate that you provided, Shalise, in this presentation? And how reliable uh, do you think that source is? The, uh, the estimate that NDC uses, and actually at, on NDC's website at ndcresearch.com, is a complete listing of the methodology that we used in coming up with the estimates. But just to describe it in simple terms, it was based on the growth that was identified through the American Community Survey. It didn't use the exact American Community Survey population totals because they are notoriously bad at um, estimating population, say in group quarters and um, other areas. So, um, so far, the little bit of analysis we've done based on the, the rough data that's come in, we've we, it hasn't been bad. Um, so our estimates have been pretty close. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Anna Horta, your hand is raised. Ch Chalice, you mentioned um, when you were talking about the paper maps, you were also talking about an Excel sheet that can add the population numbers. So I am confused as how can people do that if they're actually getting paper maps? Um, like how can they, you know, I, I don't know, is this a, can you explain that a little bit more? Yes. Uh, so there are actually two paper maps. The first one that you pick up has those population counts in them and that's all you need to submit a paper map. You don't need to use the Excel spreadsheet. You don't need anything else. You can just do that and, and use a, your own calculator to add up the, the population numbers we've provided for you in the various different population units that are spelled out on the map. Or if you want, if after you've drawn your map, you don't want to use a calculator, you can use the Excel spreadsheet. And the way you do that is you take the second map that is now, instead of population counts in each of the population units, they're all numbered consecutively. And those numbers correspond to a spreadsheet. So say you chose population uh, unit, the unit numbers 23 and 24, and that, that's gonna go into your district four. So then you would open the spreadsheet, you'd find population unit number 23, assign it to district four, population, uh, unit that's number 24, sign it to a district four, and then there's a results page. You can see what the total is. So you don't need to use the Excel spreadsheet. It's really only for those who are comfortable with Excel and don't want to use a calculator. And one, one more thing is like, um, all the tools are very different. So can you at some point describe how are you going to blend these maps when they come from such different, you know, tools, it just seems like, I, I would be interested to know that in, for, for accuracy, right? Like how do you actually blend all of these information from such different platforms? Uh, we've been doing it for decades. <laughs> so what we do is we take that map and put it into our professional um, map drawing tool. So we follow the boundaries. Those that are done with district dollar and caliper, caliper, that's done for us. They're just brought over seamlessly with shape files. But if it's a paper map, we, we redraw how, what the submitter has depicted on paper. Thank you. All right, I see Raymond is next on my list. Kirsten, you're on deck. Hi. Um, I, this may not be the appropriate place for this question, but and I guess there wouldn't there might be not be a way to map like Fred's scenario where you had um, uh, no districts uh, and, and you went to all ad hoc um, type of, of situation. What, what is it that dictates the, um, the is it the uh, municipal code? Where, where should I look for that in state code or in the municipal code of the county? to find the, the county charter that dictates the, the, the way the counties are to be uh, set up? 
or the, the districts within the county? Are there counties that, that have um, uh, at, all at, at large, large members and no districts? Uh, I can I can answer a portion of that, then Yvonne can help probably guide okay. you to the, the ordinance. But uh, no, there are no there are no longer um, any counties that are completely at large elections. And the reason for that is the California Voting Rights Act. So the California Voting Rights Act um, is targeted towards at large election systems. And virtually every county that was at large was sued to go to by districts. Hmm. As, as now a majority of the cities and many of the school districts and special districts have faced lawsuits under the California Voting Rights Act. Um, and the challenge under the California Rights Act, it's a difficult one to, um, no, no, uh, let's put it this way, no jurisdiction has been successful at defeating a California Voting Rights Act challenge. Santa Monica got an initial ruling and now it's going to the Supreme Court, um, but none have been successful at retaining their at-large systems when faced with the California Voting Rights Act. And we're talking millions of dollars um, these lawsuits, uh, uh, public money that's been spent trying to fight these lawsuits. What is the objection so, to that, or or the problem with that model? The um, well, I, the uh, the purpose of the California Rights Act is to empower protected class groups to be able to elect in the, uh, uh, their preferred candidates. So, when you think of a uh, maps are drawn to keep a geo graphically concentrated area of a certain protected class in one district, then they have a higher chance of electing their preferred candidate. I could see it going the other scenario the way too, like in our county, if you don't have a concentration of Latinos, if they're just first out, right, then how do they get Latino representation? I don't know. Yeah, okay, it doesn't, it's not a perfect model. And that's, that's uh, exactly why Santa Monica is fighting. But, gotcha. Thank you. All right, let's see. I'm looking for more hands raised. Um, oh, Kirsten, you're on deck. Yeah, here you are. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm ready. So <laughs> my first question is, um, given the points that have been thematically named um, to the point of, we know, I know, it's known that this county has historically been redlined, right? So there's a systemic thing in place that has prevented folks from living in particular parts of the community. So is there a demographer that's going to be coming into this process at any point to sort of help us couch the historical journey to where we are now, recognizing that our population has become a bit more diverse significantly, that there has been and, and will continue to be a, a, a shift in uh, representation from all communities as we continue to experience disaster to really help um, get a really close to accurate estimation on you know, the communities that we are looking to create lines or couch for in this process. Um, and maybe that's a question we probably should have asked two meetings ago, but I'm just, as we continue to unpack the things that we know are problematic with how the housing is aligned and why there aren't concentrated populations of folks that live in certain areas because they were restricted from doing so, how do we plan and map for that? Um, as you saw in some of the tools, we do have those the uh, tools that can highlight some of the particular um, uh, communities of interest, such as those who speak like, such as language fluency, um, household income. So uh, when you look at those maps, you can overlay those layers. You can see those concentrated areas. And when you're drawing your lines, be mindful to keep the darker, heavier concentrated areas of that particular category in one district. So those, those are the, the best tools that are available to help in map drawing um, to try to capture those particular communities. But given that this has been a concern that has continued to be brought up, what on your all's end, as you estimate population data for us to consider moving forward, you know, do you have an internal demographer that can look at our community, see its historical um, background, um, note that some of these housing policies have not changed in some of these communities, therefore 
you know, what does it look like for people to continue to move into this community in the next 10 years? Already noting as highlighted in our local paper and one organization has highlighted, there's been an influx of diversity coming into the county. So how is that going to be accounted for in your process that's supposed to inform us on making, realigning, reimagining lines? And then those of us who are reaching out to community members, like if we don't have those tools or an insight into what that looks like, how will we be effective in, in making that process work? Yeah, as far as projections into the future, um, and as was mentioned, it's, it, this is a snapshot in time, right? So this is a snapshot based on the census when the census was taken. And then uh, what we, what we, the data that we do have from the American Community Survey. So as far as projecting what the future will look like, as far as those concentrated areas, um, that's not within the scope of the, pro of the project. And I do have some, uh, there were a couple other questions um, that were raised by commissioners I see in the chat that I can also address, Chair, and then I, I did keep track of the public questions as well. Okay, let's go to Ana Lugo and then we'll go to the questions in the chat. Mm -hmm. Ana, go ahead. Thank you, Chair. I have a couple of questions, but I do wanna go back to Commissioner Lynch's uh, question, which I do not believe was fully answered. And I actually would like to recognize that we have Director De La Cruz in this meeting, uh, the Office of Equity. And I think that this question really goes to the county, uh, Ms. Carrie Harrow, who is uh, the Deputy Administrator at the CAO's office and the Office of Equity. And I'd love to know if it is possible for the county to provide a demographer for this commission, as it is, as Ms. Lynch has pointed out, I think it is important that we understand the considerations that we have to be taking into account when we are advising our supervisors on the maps that should be on the map on ultimately the final map that should be um, adopted. So I'd love to hear from Ms. De La, De, Director De La Cruz and Director Carajero on what your plan is to support this commission. Thank you, Ana. I was actually going to take a moment to introduce uh, Alegria, but let's, um, Alegria, while you, you've been called out, let's, um, if we, if you could introduce yourself, that would be great. Let us all know um, what you do at the county and, and what you'll be able to help, uh, help us with uh, in, in this process. Thank you, Chair Sheffield. So my name is Alegria de la Cruz. I'm the director of the Office of Equity at the County of Sonoma. Um, redistricting is something that is not currently on my work plan, but I've been asked to attend by Cristal, Director Guerrero. Um, and I'm, I'm really moved by what Ms. Lange, Commissioner Lange said. Um, historical um, echoes of past policies have led to the disproportionately negative quality of life for communities of color, not only in our country, I mean, not only in our county, but all over our country. And so it is central to the work of the Office of Equity at the County of Sonoma to really be grounded in those historical realities in order to understand why we are living in our present and why it looks and feels the way that it does, especially for communities of color. Um, and so, you know, I think the question as to how we are ensuring that that is a foundational value that is something that is understood by every person who is looking to unseat those, those historical inequities and to make policies that take into consideration that history that our country and our county is still grappling with is really central to the work of this commission. And I'm excited that um, these questions are being raised because that's exactly what the Office of Equity is working to do throughout the county as a whole in our future policy making as we move forward. So I'll leave the question as to what exactly the county will do to Director Guerrero, um, but thank you very much for inviting me here tonight. And I'm really moved by this conversation and by the questions. Thank you. Thank you, Alegria. Um, and thanks for the question. You know, we, we did have some suggestion um, about sort of the missing piece mm. of giving um, the commissioners sufficient extensive history uh, of what led to policies and where how our demographic got to where it is today in the county. Um, and to some degree, you know, our, our, our consultant NDC sort of is our demographer and our specialist in this area. Um, so I, I, I'm not sure what a demographer would, would bring to this conversation now, um, and, and except to say that um, 
you know, I, I think we're a little bit challenged in being able to provide a history lesson um, at this point. Um, I, I don't have an answer. It's a great question, Anna. Um, you know, and it's not even even about resources, but there's in part some time. But I suppose I would I would want to know like what from the commissioners um, as a whole would be looking for that demographer to give us at this point. And then Shalise, I would look to you to say, to what degree are you able to provide um, some of that historical context and sort of history, um, if it's available for Sonoma County specifically? I'd, I'd like to, oh, oh, you want me to go ahead and answer yes, what I can as far as, from, from history, um, what is important is to look at the, the districts, how they're laid out now and how well they do at, at capturing those geographical dense areas of the particular socioeconomic and uh, race, racial and ethnic categories. And I think one of the best tools to, to use is to look at the demographic summary that exists. And I, I will uh, make sure this gets added to the website as a separate sheet. And I wanna go ahead and share my screen so you know uh, of which I'm speaking. So I can give you the history of, uh, based on when these districts were um, created, they were based obviously on 2010 census data. Taking the boundaries of the existing categories, we can see how, um, and, and unfortunately, NDC was not your demographer back in 2010 when redistricting was done. So I don't have this, um, this, sheet captured from when the uh, from from 10 years ago but i can show you what what has happened today with the geographical layout of the existing districts so here we have the existing districts we have oh i'm sorry i need to make my screen bigger we have the citizen voting age population broken down by proportion for each of the districts we have Hispanic, and in this case, Hispanic slash Latino are the same. That's how it's asked on the census. That's how the census asks the question, are you Hispanic or Latino? So when it says Hispanic here, that represents our Latinx community as a whole. So you can see, um, based on the geographic boundaries that exist, the, the existing district that has the highest concentration is 21%. So that's how you use this particular demographic summary. And the question was asked about the, um, the non-Hispanic Black community and why there was not a concentration map for that. And it's because the, the percentage overall in the county is 2%. So it's too um, small uh, of a number for it to be depicted in our, um, in our thematic maps. We also have a small um, Asian American Pacific Islander population at 5%. Some of these other categories that give you a historical perspective on how the existing districts, um, uh, the statistics for the existing districts are spelled out here, starting with voter registration, voter turnout, voter turnout for 2018, and then we get down into the more socioeconomic categories such as age, immigration status for each of the districts, um, language spoken at home, English, Spanish, Asian, and other. Language fluency, those that speak English less than very well. Education level, children at home, household income, and housing status. Now with each map that is submitted, there will be the same demographic summary that's submitted with each map. So if, if for example, you're looking at the existing districts and you believe that there's a way to draw a map to um, better, say, get a higher proportion of your Latinx community in one district, um, 
you could compare it to the existing districts and see if there are maps that have done a better job at getting higher concentrated areas. And that same logic could be applied to virtually any of the categories. So I will make sure that this demographic summary of the existing districts is um, on your map drawing tool uh, page as, a, as an additional resource, because I think that that will, will help to, um, to know what the existing looks like, education level, for example. And, um, and then you can, this same information when you're using Maptitude, each one of these categories um, can also be highlighted on the map as you're drawing the map. So say as you're using that Maptitude tool and you're wanting to um, see where the areas of income, those that are making 75K and more, want to keep them in one category, in one particular district, then you can um, highlight that particular category and that heat map will show up for you. So as you're drawing your boundaries, you can draw boundaries basically around the higher concentrated colors. So I hope that that um, helps you give some understanding of the demographic data that we're going, that we have available now and that we'll be making available for each of the maps that are submitted. Thank you, Shalise. We're going to go back to um, uh, Ana Lugo. Yes. Uh, Ms. Silton, am I correct in assuming that you are a demographer? That's correct. So when I look at map at the, I think it's a website, Caliper, is that is that correct, the name of the website? Cal yeah, Caliper is the, is the company and Maptitude is the product. Yes. So when I look at the map and I go into some of the um, categories they have, I can look at uh, renters and where renters are concentrated. Um, what I would love to understand is over time, how has that shifted? So if we're looking at communities of color, I would love to understand over time how that has shifted. And so that we can better understand when we are talking about perhaps splitting the coast, when we are talking about continuing to split Roner Park, when you know commissioners bring up questions around, do we extend District 3 into an incorporated, unincorporated area, knowing that there is a history. Well, first of all, I will say it is a fact that Sonoma County is deeply segregated. It is also a fact that because some of our communities of color are such a small percentage of our complete population that they are often overlooked, our Black and African American communities especially. While we're all here to do the best job we can, right, we're not going to be able to see, and I saw it on this map, we're not going to be able to see fully where in these neighborhoods are are, are these communities most concentrated so that we're able to keep them together so that we're not splitting um, communities. So perhaps you can give a, a, some answer to that. Um, so I think that what I would really love to see is for you to come back to us with a little bit more perspective on communities that have been um, negatively impacted by um, by redistricting if we're not taking them into account. So if you are able to do some of the work, that'd be awesome. And if you can't do some of the work, then I'd, I'd like to ask uh, Ms. Carrie Harrow and Director De La Cruz to figure out how that can be done um, so that we can do our jobs. Um, I have a question on slide four. So if we go to slide four, I have to pull up my slide deck again. So if we go to the rules and go, redistricting rules and goals, I'm wondering on the third, um, the third category, Ms. Tilton, that one. Uh, number three, other traditional redistricting principles. I think uh, Director De La Cruz asked this, but I'd like to raise this again. Um, where did this come from? You are muted, Ms. Silton. Oops, there we go. Sorry about that. So these are traditional principles that have been used over the years and have held up in court um, uh, as, as being viable redistricting principles that have been used uh, for decades. 
And, um, but having said that, they're optional. And having said that, they take, um, of course, the other, the federal law and the California law take priority over them. So it just makes sense, um, also just looking on its face, minimizing voters shifted to different election years. So if it's possible, if we have to make population adjustments, we would probably first look at if folks are in a 2022 uh, assigned year, a district that's assigned to a 2022, and if we have to make population shifts, is it possible to make that population shift with another 2022 year? Or do we move a group of population to a 2024 year? And then it will have been six years since they were able to vote for a supervisor. Uh, respecting voters' wishes, uh, rather than a demographer decide um, that you can only elect one out of two, say you like, say, say the, the people really like two supervisors, but we've drawn them both in the same district. Therefore, the voters' choice is limited to just picking one. We'd rather have the voters decide who is earned re-election if we can draw lines that avoid pairing them in the same district. And then as I mentioned, future population growth um, and also as was, was mentioned, if we know there are areas that have been, there were evacuated when the census was taken, we can consider underpopulating those districts just slightly within the um, constitutionally allowable deviation of um, less than 10%. And then preserving the core of existing districts. Um, that's often uh, just a, a guiding principle. And again, either any of these can be rejected by this commission or used by this commission, or you can uh, uh, decide when you look at maps, um, whether you want to follow any of these, these, these traditional principles. They are, they are not mandates, they are options. Thank you, Ms. Hilton. My last question is for Director De La Cruz and Director Carrero. And that is that I, while I cannot um, attest to whether this traditional policies, uh, this traditional principles um, are meant to disenfranchise communities that have been historically disenfranchised, I would like to understand if you plan to give us equity-driven principles and considerations as we do this, uh, as we look to uh, redraw this map. So um, I don't know if you have an answer now, but I'd love for us to have some actual equity-driven principles and considerations to overlay on top of this uh, legal uh, requirements. I'm happy to take that up, uh, Commissioner Lugo. So unfortunately, the Office of Equity is just in a startup Mode, mode right now. So what we are working on currently for the County of Sonoma is a Race Equity 101 training that will be delivered to uh, staff first and then to our department heads and our elected officials in the second round. Um, so we're just behind the eight ball when it comes to having, you know, a, a kind of clear set of principles or at least some historical grounding for equity work in the County of Sonoma. That is coming. We are literally going to start our training process towards the end of September. So the timing is just rough. Um, I do think that it would be interesting for this commission to consider what your values, what your core values are, are in this process and to go through some kind of um, process as a commission with some facilitation um, assistance to really get at, you know, how do you as a commission together decide that you will be grounded in principles of equity and what are those principles for this commission and for this purpose? Um, I think, again, you know, uh, Director Querejero, um, I might disagree slightly with the idea that we don't have time for history, because I think that what this process is all about is recognizing that that's exactly what we have to have time for is some history. And so if we don't have that kind of that data going back, Ms. Tilton, that you you referred to in the last in the 2010 data, I would be curious about, you know, how else do we bring up those voices from underrepresented and underserved communities of color in our community? And one of the one of the um, ongoing tools that has been used by, um, by folks who have done this work for a long time is recognizing that there is power in anecdote, there is power in people's personal histories and communities' histories. Um, you know, I think about uh, Professor Greg Saris, who's also the tribal chairman of the Great and Rancheria, and the ways in which he tells such meaningful, beautiful, deep stories about the realities of his people in this community. Um, I think about the ways he tell, talks about South Park and what that means to this community, to this commission here in doing the work of respecting that history of 
Native Americans living in South Park in Santa Rosa and how that is, is that a community of interest and how do you kind of hold that history um, right in the middle of what it is that you do as you plan, plan for ensuring that those communities have representation in the future. Um, and so, and I think it's a, it's a, it's a phrase that is used all the time, right? If you, those who don't know their history are doomed to repeat it. Um, and if we are really grounded in recognizing that the structures and traditions um, that in many ways have underpinned some of the older work um, to also recognize that those structures and those traditions have typically not been built by nor served communities of color. And so how does this commission hold some of that truth um, as you move forward to creating a future that, um, that respects it? Thank you, Alegria. Uh, anything else to add um, before we move on to Anna Horta who's patiently waiting? Go ahead, Anna. Yeah, I, I, you know, after hearing all uh, several comments from uh, Anna Lugo and um, Director De La Cruz, I, I do think it's very important. I know that we are trying um, to have, you know, equal representations through this process. However, the inequities, <laughs> you can still see the inequities reflect in the process itself. The fact that the tools that we are giving to draw these maps, which are incredible, but they're also highly inaccessible by so many of us and so hard to understand. So I really think it's, it's huge and key to what Anna Lugo said about the equity driven principles to have that along the tools that we're using, knowing that those tools that we're using already are so, um, you know, a way for and not being able to be reached by communities of color or underserved communities. This is not going to be easy. It's not, this is not going to be easy for us. Um, I don't know how, you know, the community is supposed to come and do this work. So if we can have those values and those principles, it will be extremely helpful. Thank you. That's all I want to say. Thank you, Anna. Socorro, your hand is up. I just wanted to, um, one, thank you, uh, Director De La Cruz and uh, Commissioner Lang. I, I have been thinking about this history issue and I think if we, and to what um, Ana Lugo was saying, if, if we're to truly protect communities of interest, but they have been, um, forcibly separate it to disallow a power of community, I do think it is important that we understand the, those decisions and the ramifications they'll make, and they have made. And I think last time we met, everybody was pretty clear that we're willing to do, I thought, I thought I heard this. So if I'm misrepresenting us people, please speak up. But I thought I heard people say we'd be willing to meet more to do the job well. I know that many people take this assignment, all of us, I believe, very seriously and understand the weight that is, will follow these recommendations to the supervisor. So I, it, even if it takes more time, I do find it incredibly important to understand the request made about the history of what got us to this place so that we can find and make sure we have uplifted these communities of interest. Thank you. Thank you, Socorro. Kirsten, your hand is raised. Yes, sorry. So I think the important thing that I don't want to be lost in this is part of the options then are, you know, future population growth and preserving the core of the existing districts. It's a little hard to do both if we don't talk about or have a clear understanding of what the history is and the significance and why I bring up a demographer specifically because this person is trained into understanding the history and how to use statistical models based on the data to move things forward. And so if that indeed is not in the scope of Shalisa's work to what she mentioned earlier, then I think it would be incumbent on us to understand who else could support the process 
in partnership with what we already have going on. And if that means another small working group is formed to see that forward, then I think it's a value because we can't pretend like these things don't exist mm -hmm. in order to decide what happens for purposes of checking the box that this process happened. Because I think I read very clearly, this won't happen again for another 10 years. And so we already know what the disparities are and there are more that we probably haven't unpacked because of the connection to communities. And so if that's in the optional traditional, um, what we can be considering, then I think we need, like that's a part of the due diligence of being effective in this right. work. Right, absolutely. Absolutely. And, and I know that that's my focus, my primary primary focus in this process. I will do my best. I know that, you know, us commissioners, we were we were chosen again because of our um, connectedness to the community. And I know that, you know, might not be our job, um, but that is to me personally, that is my focus. I intend to make that my focus and the, the outreach that I am doing currently and that I will continue to do is keeping that in mind. I want to move on to the next agenda item if we don't have any other questions. Um, I'm looking at the time at 7.51. Um, I think we had some really good discussion here. Um, um, let's see, I see, um, I do see a hand raised. Uh, Stephen? And you're on mute. First of all, uh, Director Dela Cruz, I've been hoping to meet you, uh, but the pandemic has stopped that. Um, many, many years ago when I was a young person uh, and I worked with CRLA, I was the directing attorney of CRLA in Madera, California. I, I worked with some of your family members. So it's just an honor uh, to see what you've grown into and, and what you're doing right now. Um, and it's really great because you stimulated um, the discussion that I wanted to have. I have just written um, Supervisor Hopkins telling her that I think it inappropriate that I serve on this and I am resigning. I'm far less interested in math and maps. Um, I'm far more interested in definitions of equity uh, and definitions of equity that go beyond um, some of the common things uh, like ethnicity and race. I mean, there's a lot of disenfranchisement that is caused by other factors. For example, the it's very difficult to get the same quality of representation out to the rural areas that you get in the urban areas. You know, I'm from Bodega Bay. I'm the assistant fire chief in Bodega Bay. Uh, I have been lobbying this board of supervisors to get equitable funding to the emergency medical services in, in the vast um, fifth district. And it's very obvious to me that people who have these very small districts have much greater access physically and emotionally to their representatives and that the representatives who represent the urban incorporated areas have a very different outlook uh, on the way, uh, what, what enfranchisement means and the way that they relate to their constituents. So, you know, I, Linda asked me to do this because of my really frustrating experiences with the County Board of Supervisors and the difficulty it is um, to have a real meaningful elected representative uh, in some of these districts. Um, you know, I, I really will not be good at drawing maps and you know, for that reason, I am going to withdraw and let Linda put someone on here who will do a better job. But you know, it, it's great, Director De La Cruz, that it came from you because I know your family. But we really should be talking about what equity means, and it means a lot more than simply balancing out, you know, ethnicity or race. I mean, really fair representation, so that my vote means the same as the vote of someone who lives in Santa Rosa or in one of these really tiny little districts. I have had a supervisor from an urban area tell me in a supervisor's meeting, well, certainly the people who live in the rural areas do not expect the same quality of healthcare that the people who live in the cities do. And I said, no, we certainly do. And that's been a friction throughout. So I think that's a discussion that ought to be held. I will tell you, I'm totally unsuited for this mission. And I've already written um, Supervisor Hopkins telling her that I'm gonna tender my resignation tomorrow. I deeply appreciate being a part of this and listening to the discussion. And again, uh, Director De La Cruz, your, your family was tops. Those are some wonderful years and, and you're really a great chip off the block. So thank you all. All right, well, thank you, Stephen. I'm sorry to hear that you'll be stepping down. Obviously you have a lot of input and insight. Um, your intention to, to resign tomorrow 
maybe you can reconsider. I think that you have a lot to offer us. Uh, uh, clearly, you do. Um, I'm going to move on to um, to Chris Bohr. Thank you, Chair Sheffield. Um, I, I think the, the question of equity is, is critical to our overall mission and obligation. And I would encourage that we um, somehow develop uh, you know, principles of equity that would help guide our decisions. Perhaps that could be done by a small working committee that would work between now and the next meeting to bring a proposed list of um, principles um, to then have us uh, review potentially in advance of the meeting and then hopefully adopt. That could be one path forward. There are probably other paths forward. The one thing I think that could be very helpful for us is I know there is um, you know, a significant amount of building going on, uh, building of residential units you know, throughout the county. Um, and I know that there's a lot of residential construction planned but not yet started. It, I don't know how easy this could be, but you know, insight to housing units under construction or expected in the next, say, two to three years by city or, or area you know, could really help us anticipate where those population growth you know, will likely occur. Um, it's a little bit of a slippery slope, though. I realize and acknowledge that we don't know if these developments are actually going to go to fruition, um, but there are certainly a number that are underway now that at least have a reasonable expectation to have some number of houses completed between now and say two or three years or maybe even four years. The one thing that that will not answer for us though, and this gets back um, uh, to Commissioner uh, Bedoya and Commissioner Lang's comments is about the shifts of population within the existing housing um, inventory. That's really, really difficult to anticipate or even I think document if that data could at all be available, I think that could be very helpful, but be that as it may, as an unfortunate reality of our mission as a commission here, we may not have the perfect data sets that will give us the highest level of confidence in all our decisions, given the timeline we have to reach. But we have to make our best effort to collect the information and at least understand so that if necessary, we can make educated guesses. And, and at that point, we'll have to live with the consequences. With imperfect data, we can backfill that imperfection with understanding of the communities and the trends we've seen. And then at the end of the day, we have to make our best judgment calls. Um, but the strength is that we're many people, many voices, many connections, and going back to that foundation of equity, I think will really help us achieve what we're setting out to do. Okay. Thank you, Chris. And I see that we still have hands up. I, I, you know, I, I want to make sure that we're inclusive as possible, bringing in the public. I'm just gonna, we'll, we'll jump back to you, uh, Karen and Anna, but before we do, I'm just looking at the time. I want to jump to, to all the way to agenda item four, public comment, um, public comment, um, for matters not on the agenda. I want to just, I want to acknowledge that there might be some people who have been waiting a long time and then we'll circle back um, and have some more discussion uh, among the commissioners. So at this time, is there any, any folks in the public who, who have been waiting to speak? So I do know that I've received some um, messages from Fred. There's an anonymous, anonymous attendee um, who have both sent some messages, so I'm not sure if they'd like to go ahead and raise their hands so they can give those comments verbally. Um, but for now, um, Deborah McKay has raised her hand, and so we want to go ahead and switch over to her. This was not formally on your agenda, but it did come up in your meeting to have some equity standards, and I think that would be really crucial for this committee to devote some time to that. I think it's a great suggestion to form a committee to do that, uh, maybe a committee of four people or something like that that could do that work. But I think you're going to really um, benefit from having those guidelines and having them early on, because that can guide you in a lot of your other decisions along the way. So I hope you will really follow up on that uh, suggestion and make sure that that happens. So that can be one of your optional guiding principles. 
Thank you. Thank you, Deborah. And we now have Fred who has raised his hand. So we'll go ahead and unmute Fred. Thank you very much. I'm a member of the public who has a big mouth. And I just wanted to say that I second the last person's comment. And I think that the uh, having equity principles is a great idea. And, and that's what parity is all about. And that's all I have to say now. Thank you, Fred. Other comments from the public? I do not see any other hands from the public raised at this time, but I would like to just pause here and ask how, I'm not sure if this is something for legal counsel to weigh in on, or if there's a preference of this commission for the comments that were kind of submitted after public comment, kind of while the conversation went on, um, how would you like those handled? Would you like me to go ahead and read them out loud at this point? Um, um, this is Linda Shilkin with County Council's Office. I think the question is when we're on agenda item number two, you received additional public comment and you're asking if you should be reading them. And I think that's great for the commission to hear what the comments are. Um, we've then switched to agenda item number four. So I just think it's really important to be clear for the public so they can know where we're at. If we, um, when we're closing out of an agenda and moving on to another, just to make sure that people are aware of where we're at. So it's clear, but I think it's a good idea to read the public comment that was submitted. Okay, so I will go ahead and read these out. So again, these were public comments that came in after the public comment period had technically closed under the public hearing item, um, but these all were all received at that time. So we had um, Fred um, Albuck who said, there is no chance for Springs Latinos to overcome District 1 and they have been externalized red line from Sonoma. Uh, he also sent another comment that said District 1 is 83% non-Hispanic white, maybe need to move that cursor to change these numbers to make number one match the other districts, but that still does not give parity maps, maybe can't give parity in this way. And then his last comment was gerrymandering is cracking and packing, but looking for parity should be fine in segregated Sonoma County parity of map numbers is equity make five new districts, ditch district three, all radiating from Santa Rosa and load a few of these with more parity for the Latinx cohort, try for 50% in one district. And then we also did have an anonymous attendee. Um, so there was no name um, who left two comments. The first is thank you, language access on educating people about these maps is going to be crucial, especially what Commissioner Lang brought up, not every zip code is created equally. And then the other comment says, uh, Pataluma has an unincorporated areas where local elections can be at a disadvantage. For supervisor race, unincorporated areas are an advantage versus city council slash school board race can be a disadvantage. Pataluma is also segregated by west side of Pataluma and east side is predominantly Latinx low income middle class. Population has increased with the Latinx community. Renters have also increased versus homeowners. LGBTQ have also increased. Using demographer would be valuable. Access is equitable. And those complete those comments. And there are still no additional hands raised at this time. Okay. I want to make sure that we're staying within the legal lines here for this meeting. I want to circle back and let's close out our discussion on agenda item number two before we move on to, to um, agenda item number three. Okay, we did have a hand raised from Karen, hand is still raised in Ana Lugo, and then I hope we can close out. Okay. Thank you, Chair Sheffield. Um, I just wanted to throw my voice in to having um, some equity standards, and I'd like to hopefully by the end of the meeting we can close that out with either a subcommittee, an ad hoc committee, something. Um, and also, um, I guess probably what I also want to talk about is not on, it's not just part of number two, but I'm going to just throw out the additional meetings that we talked about last time, which um, I believe Mr. Bohr brought up also that I think it was him or maybe it was Ms. Shields that we talked about um, having additional meetings and I haven't heard a result of that either. So thank you, Mr. Sheffield. Thank you, Karen. Um, Anna, do you want to finish us off? 
I am good, Chair. Thank you. Great. Okay, we are now moving on to <laughs> agenda item number three, uh, public outreach and engagement. Yvonne, um, uh, would you share with, the, share with us any updates? Um, and maybe at this point you can talk about um, the ad hoc. Right. So um, Yvonne Shu with the County Administrator's Office. Uh, before I get started, I wanted to clarify um, that I will be providing an update on the county's redistricting outreach. Um, for those of you uh, listening who are especially interested um, in the outreach efforts, item number five on the agenda, uh, commissioner updates, um, is expected to include outreach updates from individual commissioners. So with that, I will move us along. Um, so I wanted to highlight a couple of additions to the overall calendar, which you saw at the beginning of our meeting. And um, these are new um, you know, since the last meeting. So we have added a training session, as Shalise mentioned, for all of the mapping tools. Um, at the October 5th board meeting, um, there will be the review of the 2020 data. We'll have it at that point. After which point, um, we've added an additional um, deadline for the public to provide feedback for input into those for consideration into the draft maps. Um, and so regarding um, you know, the discussion that has occurred regarding setting up another group um, to perhaps look at those equity principles, I do wanna share um, that we have an ad hoc um, committee comprised of four of, our, of your commissioners. Uh, we met for the first time last week and you will have, you'll get a little update on that during the commissioner updates as well, number five. Um, one thing that is not on the calendar, which um, didn't make it in time because it's hot off the press, is that we have um, just confirmed a community town hall on redistricting for September 15th at 4 p.m. This is another opportunity uh, for the public and uh, for everyone to get an overview of the redistricting process and to understand how to provide input and also to provide input at that time. Uh, this is not a meeting of the Advisory Redistricting Commission. This is something that the county is putting on and login details will be posted um, in the near future. But we will have, um, at least as of right now, Supervisor Hopkins will be providing introductory comments um, and um, NDC will be providing a brief overview and then there'll be a Q&A session and we'll have the chair and vice chair of the ARC um, representing at that time. So I will send out more details as that gets more fully developed. Um, that was just recently confirmed. So, and the county is continuing its outreach uh, to community-based organizations with input from the commissioners, the Office of Equity and other county staff. Um, one event that I'd like to highlight um, is on this Thursday on KBBS um, Leaders del Futuro, I'm sure I'm butchering, butchering that, um, show is coming this Thursday at 6 p.m. And Ana Horta, our vice chair, will be on there talking about redistricting. Um, and so once those details come out, I will send those out as well, but I just wanted to share some of the things that are going on. Um, Finally, we are you know, continuing to improve and expand our communication vehicles, including the website, um, which got a little mini facelift. You know, we have radio ads going on. Uh, we have videos posted and we have them running in, in some of the, the supermarkets as well, um, and also on social media. And we're continuing to, to develop additional flyers. And um, you know, I'm using, um, I'm gonna be providing feedback from, getting feedback, excuse me, from the ARC uh, ad hoc moving forward on future communications. Thank you, that's it. Thank you, Ivana. Just a quick question. It seemed like sure. there was some more interest in folks participating in an ad hoc with a focus on equity. Is there opportunity for commissioners, other commissioners to join? We know that there's a, you know, we wanna make sure that it's not too large of a group, um, but I, it, it does sound like there are, um, there are commissioners who are interested. Right, so maybe, you know, I, maybe a little <laughs> logistically challenging, but perhaps it can just be a separate group for mm -hmm. those equity principles and we'll keep the one that we have right now for, for outreach, okay. unless there's strong inclination to just add to the existing ad hoc. Okay, um, so how do we go about doing that? It seems like there, we really do wanna have a focus on equity. We've heard from a number of commissioners already a second ad hoc, or I don't know what we would call it, 
a, a separate meeting to make sure that we're following within Brown Act requirements mm -hmm. of, of a, an opportunity for you know a, a core group of commissioners who are interested in the the equity focus. Because I think we all should be interested in the equity focus, but maybe you know a core group that could could be driving this. Thoughts. <laughs> I don't, Linda, do you have any recommendations? You the spot, <laughs> um, I think it's been a resounding concern from the commission that there needs to be a discussion about history and also equitable principles to be um, created and addressed early in this process. So I think an idea of um, putting together on your next agenda, um, a discussion about creating an equitable and historical or whatever this commission decides, ad hoc committee is fine to do. And it sounds like it would be meeting what has been a theme throughout this entire meeting. So that is one way to be going about doing that. And then the commissioners who are interested in participating on that ad hoc could be expressing their interest. And then the commission could vote on the next agenda about who should be sitting on this ad hoc. Great, great, Linda, thank you. Um, clarifying questions, Judy, you have your hand raised. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, Yvonne, thank you for the report. You had mentioned that you have been doing outreach to community-based organizations. Can you provide us a little more information as far as what the response has been? Do you need help um, meeting with some of these organizations? How can we be more engaged with you? So I'm not, obviously not doing it all by myself. I'm having, I have assistance um, from Trepepia Smith who has been, you know, um, calling all of them actually individually. And so I don't know what the percentage is of the organizations we've received a positive response from. And that by that, I mean, they either want to be on our email distribution, they would like to have a presentation done by, not, by us, or they just, they're just generally interested. Um, but we are planning to do, you know, a second round of outreach and we continue to, you know, take in additional um, names of organizations. So if you have any um, that you'd like to share with us that we can we'd be happy to um, outreach to them and, and offer up information and or presentation. Okay, we'll get to that on on agenda item number five. Yep, as well. Okay, Chris. Uh, thank you, Chair Sheffield. You know, the, my my only quick comment is, you know, I feel the sense of urgency to establish the equity principles because. The earlier we have a foundation, the more confidence we're going to have in our decisions and work that will follow. Um, I'm concerned that our next meeting may not be for some time. So establishing a committee to work on equity could be a month away or, or maybe even more looking at the calendar. So I would urge action beginning tonight to establish a committee. And I guess I wasn't aware that there was an ad hoc committee. So for transparency's sake, I'd like to know who are our, our members on the ad hoc committee and what's the ad hoc committee's scope? Maybe okay. maybe equity would be within the scope or maybe, maybe, maybe not. So the ad hoc was created out of our previous uh, meeting where we wanted to have more of a focus on outreach. And so um, I had sent um, some communication, communications out to the group asking uh, about interest in establishing that ad hoc. And so um, the four commissioners who are on that um, today um, are uh, Kirsten Lang, Mike Martini, uh, Rocio Rodriguez, and Veronica Vences. And Thank so the, the scope was to focus on out, outreach and make sure that we are you know, doing a concerted effort to get to those parts of the community that, that need it. Now, whether we expand that scope to include uh, you know, the equity principles, I think is not a decision for me, obviously, but it's for, for the group. Well, you know, I, I, I agree with you completely, Chris, that, you know, equity has been, it's really been the, the focus of the discussions that we've had in all of our meetings, you know, and I mean, any type of action tonight, if we're going to do this, I, I agree that, 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 um, and, and maybe, maybe other commissioners, um, can, can jump in, but I, I, I think, I think that you're right that you know our, our meetings are, so, are spaced so far apart. If we really want to continue with this equity focus, I would like to see some type of commitment, some type of action tonight, of some sort. I'm not sure what that looks like, but making more work for you, Yvonne. I know. 
if I if I may, are we allowed to make a a, a motion and um, vote on it in our and and without it um, to form that or is that not allowed because it's not on the agenda? So again, this is Linda Shulkin with County Council. It's far preferable to have more descriptive agenda items on uh, so that members of the public are aware. There is, for example. Um, an, yeah, an, an outreach ad hoc committee, and there's going to be an update about what that is um, would be useful. Um, equity is it is a core of the entire purpose of this group. So I see so that maybe interest in you'd want to have interest in the, that being agendized. I, I get that. Yeah. Well, well it, it, it would be um, helpful to have more clear agendas, but because equity is so much a part of the federal laws, the state laws, and everything about this group and what this group's mm -hmm. function is, that I, I think that it is um, still within the com, um, the boundaries of the Brown Act because of the very nature of this commission to be discussing creating an equity ad hoc committee with okay. the agenda that you have today if you want to move forward with that. But I would suggest that in the future, um, that the agendas are more clear with um, if there's going to be an update from a certain ad hoc committee so that members of the public are on fair notice that this is going to be happening and they know when they can be participating and understanding when this is happening. Okay, thank you. Okay, Anna. I just want to thank Ms. Ms. Dilgan. Am I saying your last name correct? It's fine. Nobody can say my name. It's okay. Um, thank you for saying that equity is core to this process because so far equity has been thrown to the side, ignored and silenced in this process. And it's actually been a process that's been pretty inequitable um, for board for both commissioners and the public as a whole. So speaking of community engagement, I asked the county uh, to tell me what you consider culturally responsive community engagement. So I'd love to know if you have had the opportunity to figure out what that is. That's a question that you're posing, Anna. Is that is that put out there? I'm yes, not sure if we have our last agenda item. Was it agenda item three that we just finished? That we are, you know, we're 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 still circling back to close out agenda item number two. I would like to get on with the meeting, but um, but the presentation that Miss um, Shu just gave was agenda item three. So okay. I have agenda item three. Oh, somehow we're still having conversation that is circling back. I, we're we're looping here. Okay. okay, well, what I want to do is I want to move the agenda forward. I don't know if, if we have a response um, from from Linda from County Council on this. I, I Again, I'm, I'm looking at the time. I'm looking at where we need to be. We understand that equity is the focus here. I don't know how else we can move forward in, in you know, other than acknowledging that equity is the focus. So I'm on agenda, on agenda item three. That's what I'm speaking to. Okay. And one way that I've heard is that there's been a desire to move forward with equity with an ad hoc committee and do that tonight rather than waiting for the next meeting. So with agenda item number three, it's public outreach and engagement update. Um, the very state laws that mandate public outreach specifically discuss reaching out to underrepresented communities and um, has in its core legal requirements equity. Um, so I think that it falls within the parameters of this agenda to have a discussion about a, a creation of an equity ad hoc um, within this agenda item three be, and, and take action on this tonight so that we can move forward was if that is what the committee wants to do um, is within the legal parameters. Okay, we're, we're hearing that we thought we would like to move forward. Um... Do we want to have, we want to be formal about this? Do we want to have a motion? Um, wait, Mr. Martini has his hand up. You know, the, probably, you know, everybody, everybody suggested that they, they want to have this. Um, I, I think at this point, and I really appreciate council's uh, comment that equity is the core to this whole process. And rather than do an ad hoc committee, what I would suggest is that we just schedule uh, another meeting of this committee uh, within the next two weeks um, and do a discussion that has been 
uh, on the agenda on what does uh, an equity lens mean and invite the public uh, to participate as well and do it as the committee and not do it as an ad hoc. And I think that is within the range of, of this committee to do exactly that. Okay, thank you, Ms. Martini. Others for input? Very good suggestion. Anna Lugo? I am inclined to agree with Commissioner Martini that we do a full commission uh, equity session and invite the public. I think the public needs to be a part of this process. Thank you. Chris? Uh, my only concern is that sausage making uh, to develop principles can be very messy and very unclear. And um, my concern is from my experience, oftentimes a commission that can react to a draft or straw man set of principles can be much more efficient in whittling down and arriving at consensus. Um, but it's really up to the pleasure of the committee. Um, that's just been my experience in working in you know, medium to larger size groups like this. Okay, I, I see a lot more hands coming up, but I do want to point out that it is now 821. We only had, you know, our interpreters scheduled until 815. Um, I, I want to be mindful, respectful of other people's time as well. Um, looking for, you know, acknowledgement, uh, but maybe a formal motion if we want to have a future meeting in the next couple, two weeks. Um, with equity being the focus, we can agendize this within the parameters. Anybody want to? Socorro, I see your hand. Well, I was just going to say the what the um, my, the ad hoc committee that was never just engagement. It was equitable engagement. So perhaps if the existing subcommittee, um, if they want to meet and do the uh, initial draft and we respond to that. I mean, it, the whole intention was that be about equitable outreach, outreach. and not just simply outreach. So right. that was my understanding. Okay, thank you. Elizabeth, I see your hand raised. Yeah, I'll just concur with, uh, with um, Commissioner Shields there. What I was gonna suggest is that we schedule a meeting, we have some time before we actually get into the maps and can look at the data. Let's schedule a meeting where we can have this discussion about equity so we can devote some time to it. Um, but in the meantime, I, I think it would be, I agree that having some people, much like we're doing for the Board of Supervisors, have some people pull some information, some data, some you know, history, some principles, what are some, you know, what are, what, what's, what are the standards now? You know, what are the things that we should be looking at so that we're not having too broad a scope as a large commission um, and trying to whittle it down? I would like to see um, some people who are deeply involved in this issue come back with some suggestions for all of us so we can adopt some principles and use that as a foundation moving forward. And I think we can look at that um, every time we pull out a map and that we're, we're holding ourselves to those principles as we move forward. So Elizabeth, are you saying, I mean, it sounds like there are two, two ideas that are floating around. One of them is to have a, 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 another meeting, a full meeting of, of this commission. We'll have equity as the focus. Another is to have a discussion within the ad hoc because the ad hoc is, was, was created with an understanding of, um, of outreach in an equitable way. Is that, so I'm hearing two different ideas. I think, I think yeah, excuse me. I, I think an ad hoc, somebody that can uh, boil down some suggested principles for the entire group to look at, whether or not that's within the scope of the existing ad hoc around outreach, I would defer to them to say they wanna take that on. But mm -hmm. if there could be a smaller group to look at coming up with some proposed principles that then we could all look at and have some discussion um, possibly um, expand that, whittle it, clarify it, but then then we can have a more focused discussion rather than just sort of a brainstorm, which could take us hours right. to come up with a few things. Okay. And Anna Horta? I was thinking, can we perhaps have like a Google document that we can all put our ideas and, you know, that what what is equity for all of us? What, what are the principles? And then have someone look at that document, perhaps the other ad hoc committee, and then meet, have the meeting in two weeks, like Mr. Martinez, uh, Martini suggested, 
because I think it's very valuable for all of us to meet and discuss this and also have the public um, give input. Okay. Raymond? Yeah, I think we can have the best of both worlds, um, I, guess, I guess, as Anna's suggesting. I think that's a really good idea. Um, and as Elizabeth, Elizabeth said, to, to be able to have something to, to help guide our, our um, if we're going to have a conversation in two weeks, to help guide that conversation and, and, and make it fruitful instead of starting off from scratch. So I think that's a really good idea. Okay, so real quick, maybe a pulse check if we can see an interest, raise of hands, showing that maybe you're interested in this two-prong approach of having the ad hoc do some addressing if they if this is something that they really want to take on. We have four members of the ad hoc um, here from you guys if this is something and and or others who want to participate in that with we, and again come back in two weeks. Um, the, the clock is ticking on this, so we really do need to 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 develop some type of action. May Ana I Lugo, may I make an attempt? Ana Lugo, go ahead. May I make an attempt to do a motion based on everybody's feedback and see if we can Please. get this passed? OK, great. Uh, I move to create an ad hoc to focus on building preliminary equity principles, taking into account the history of uh, redistricting process in Sonoma County, and to um, set a meeting to discuss those preliminary principles with the whole commission. Uh, in the, I'm going to say next month, um, and that there be some sort of Google document that takes into account or that, that, that allows commissioners as a whole to put in their feedback so that the ad hoc has something to work with. Does that work for everybody? Can we get a second? I, I think I'm second that. Hey, with the Google Docs with the commissioners all talking, that would be an open and public meeting. So that's the only, I, I'm not trying to interfere with policy here. I just wanna make sure we're not having an inadvertent Brown Act, Google Act public meeting going on. But the creation of an ad hoc committee if the commission support, supports it and then scheduling another meeting for the whole commission to discuss this with public viewing what the recommendations are, sounds um, very appropriate from a legal perspective with Brown Act. Thank you, Ms. Dilgan. So a friendly yeah. amendment would be an opportunity, uh, people can just email into the redistricting email of their suggestions and that gets handed to the group. It sounds like that would be the most appropriate. All right. The public or commissioner. Um, well, I think- I would second that with um, with Christine, with Christine's- um, uh, Right, because the issue is the communicating on the document. So if everyone emails their suggestions to the redistricting email, that is collected and handed to the committee to review. I think that keeps us as close right. to compliant as possible. If the county is able, has the capacity to invite public input to that, um, I guess maybe a social media post to do this with a charge to do the same, but also an open invitation to the public meeting, right? To contribute as well. Uh, How does that work, Linda? So if an ad, um, an ad hoc committee is able to meet if they are discussing and they're less than a quorum. So if you have discussions, whether it be a Google Doc or um, everybody talking, um, even if it's serial, that's still getting into a public meeting. Um, so we can have less than a quorum talking to do an initial um, equity principles, get it together and then post that publicly. And then the whole group can talk when they meet um, so that the public has an opportunity to hear all of the commissioners, which is more than a majority, discussing their thoughts on whatever the ad hoc committee came up with. That is a legal option that I see that um, I'm, I'm hoping would meet your interests. Okay. But Anna, I, you know that you're, you're leading the charge on this ad hoc. Um, now Wait, can you just clarify, Chair Sheffield, um, let's just calm down. Uh, can I... Uh, clarify the motion so we can vote on it? Well, just before we do, if we're voting on this motion, are we forming an ad hoc tonight? That's what I'm, yeah, that's what okay, I'm- Okay, so to should we then maybe identify members of this ad hoc or would we rather just pass the motion? Can we pass the motion and have Ms. Uh, Shu email us? 
to see. Okay, we have a motion that's been amended and we have a, any seconds to the motion. Okay, I see Karen Week second the motion. All right. Um, all in favor of the motion as amended, and I don't even have the language, but we are recording this. Thank you. All in favor, raise your hand. We'll get a, a count here. Okay, any opposed? Very formal. Very formal. We have uh, opposition from one. Okay. All right, so we, 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 we've got the motion passes. Okay, the next step then, anybody wanting to lead the, lead the charge on the ad hoc on a Lugo? I, it will be my pleasure to volunteer to serve on the ad hoc. All right, anybody else volunteering to be on this ad hoc so we don't exceed a, a quorum? I see uh, Lindsay's hand raised. I see Mike, Mike's hand raised. I see Socorro's hand raised. Okay. Anybody else here? All right. This is. Oh, I see Anna Horta's hand raised. Okay. I think we have a good starting point here. Now the next step is we want to make sure that we do this in it, it, timely fashion. We, we it was proposed that we do it have a full meeting, the ad hoc comes to a full meeting of the commission in two weeks. Is that what I hear? And is that something that we can do, Yvonne? Well, we certainly can. I just need to put a date out there and yes. everyone's gonna have to try to attend, I think, because you know we have resources that we need to get on board. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I think that there was enough interest from us that we should be able to get a quorum for Okay. May I request that the Office of Equity be present at that meeting, please? We'll have to see what the county agrees to, but um, I like that idea. Chair Sheffield, I'd suggest that we should do it on September 6th. That's two weeks from tonight. Okay, do you wanna put that out there for us, Yvonne, and hope that uh, we can have attendance? That is Labor Day. That's Yeah, that's a holiday. Oh. Sorry, Mike. I'm working. <laughs> Okay, maybe Yvonne will put a date out there for us. Well, how about the seventh? I mean, it's Tuesday. I mean, Tuesday. It's Supervisor's Day. Can we please do this over email? Because I need to, I to look at calendars. I, I, I agree. Look at calendar. Well, you you asked to get it going, so yeah. No, I hear you. I hear you. We weren't prepared for this tonight. Okay, so I, I think we'll do this over email and we'll settle on a date. We do really need to move on. It is 8.30. So real quick, Chair Sheffield, we did have a couple of public comments come in while this uh, while the group was talking. So I think Great. I need to go ahead and just read those off real quick. Thank you, please. So the first one was from Amy Pearl. Uh, and she says, community outreach. I learned about this meeting uh, and the other meetings from the Sonoma County Black Forum. I haven't seen anything on Nextdoor, which is organized by neighborhoods. So maybe you're not targeting mine, which is next to Oakmont. And then the next one, the next two were actually from Fred um, Albeck again. And it sounds like um, he was commenting on the process. So his first one says someone can move to discuss forming an equity ad hoc at the next meeting, and then vote on that only tonight, then notice and schedule the next meeting ASAP. And then his next comment says move during commissioner comments at the end. Um, and I currently do not see any hands raised. Um, from the attendees. Great, thank you so much. And thank you for the public who is, are listening and participating. Okay, we have uh, closed out agenda item number three. We had jumped to, to agenda item number four. Sounds like we just got um, public comment again. And now I'd like to jump to agenda item number five. Agenda item number five, commissioner updates, um, ARC members, any updates, any suggestions for community groups that may be interested in helping with the redistricting process? Any members want to share with us, with this group, who they have already personally reached out to or who they intend to? Chair Sheffield, I've provided a, uh, just a report on the groups that I've already uh, spoken with, uh, and it's part of the record. Yes, thank you so much, Mr. Martini. You've been very active, much appreciated. 
other members, other commissioners? Um, Karen Weeks. Thank you. Um, I wanted to report out that on September 13th, um, the League of Women Voters of Sonoma County and Marin County are going to be doing a forum on redistricting in kind of in general and then specifically for Sonoma and Marin County. And I can forward the information um, on that to uh, Yvonne. Yes, please. And that, that date one more time for, for so, people who are listening. September 13th at 1130. Great. Thank you. Other commissioners, anything to share? I'll share that I've had um, several discussions with, I'll say, policy experts, some colleagues, um, and maybe some local elected officials who are very interested in utilizing the mapping tools. Um, so um, now that that is available for folks, um, people are, are interested. Um, let's see, Elizabeth, I see your hand raised. Uh, yeah, I just um, followed up. I'm aware that councils, um, city councils have been contacted, but I did follow up and reach out to all the members of city councils in the fourth district. That's the district that I, I was appointed to represent, Healdsburg, Cloverdale, Windsor, um, ask them to please announce these uh, meetings um, to get a copy of the schedule and announce these meetings in their, um, in their comments, in their meetings. Um, I reached out to um, the county superintendent of schools, Dr. Harrington, encouraged him to share this with his schools, potentially make this a project for some of their government classes and high schools, get the youth involved and interested. Um, he did indicate he would forward that to his principals. Um, and I also did reach out to an individual member of the equity um, core group, the Office of Equity, who I happen to know personally, who was a colleague. Um, and he said he would certainly share that with other core members. So I hope to encourage them to pay attention to what we're doing and, and use their individual and uh, personal networks to share the information. Great, thank you so much, Elizabeth. Rocio? Um, I've been reaching out to some fire survivor groups um, in Sonoma County in different districts that were affected. Uh, nothing's been scheduled yet, but I just wanted to um, talk about that. Great, thank you. Veronica? Yes, so uh, a couple things. I'm gonna be uh, representing or talking about what we're doing um, through the charla. So that's something that happens in district one through Supervisor Warren's um, community outreach effort. That's gonna be September 9th at 5.30 PM. It's held in Spanish. Um, and then I also connected with the Latino Community Foundation. They have really great outreach material that doesn't necessarily focus on mapping. It focuses on the strategy of telling your community and why it matters to keep your community together. So I'll send that over to Yvonne to circulate with everyone. Um, and thinking about um, just doing like a podcast or something that really drills down what we're talking about and makes it understandable and digestible. So once that is up and running, we'll also I'll also have it circulated to this group. Great. All right. You know, I want to get a stack of the paper maps and I just want to carry it around with me. It's the easiest way to do it. I know that when I was part of this process um, for, for city schools, I saw a lot of paper maps. So that's one way to go. Um, let's see, Ana Lugo and then Kirsten. Yes, I uh, will be having a discussion with both Vice Chair Horta and uh, Commissioner Vences tomorrow on KBBF as part of a uh, radio show I co-host. Um, it'll be at 7 p.m. I have also started communications with uh, local community groups. I've communicated uh, via email with the Norway Organizing Project and Norway Jobs with Justice and we'll continue to do, uh, have communications with them. I've also used social media um, and there will be other groups that I will be reaching out to that I'll report on next time. Great, thank you, Anna. Kirsten. Uh, very much in the same. So the NAACP's uh, legal office of general counsel has hosted a series of redistricting uh, trainings that I hope you all have had the opportunity to tune into. If you did not read the 89 page pamphlet, provides <laughs> a lot of insight um, verbally, which is a little bit easier to digest. Um, 
they will do one more segment of those series and I'm waiting to hear back from the legal um, point of contact that I've been working with to get an understanding of um, what that series and segment will look at. And so as soon as those dates are available, I will forward the communication. Um, they also will do some mapping conversations by region um, to have people who are experts um, with working in demography for this region. So stay tuned for that follow-up. Um, this Saturday, I will be presenting at the Sonoma County Black Forum meeting, and as soon as the invite is available, I will forward it out to you all, and we'll do similar presentations with um, the NAACP locally here, and we'll partner with uh, Commissioner Rodriguez to work with the Sonoma County Democratic Clubs. Excellent. Thank you. Jeff? Yeah, um, I've reached out, obviously, to Coffee Park and Coffee Strong um, to get the information out in that area. I've also talked to um, uh, one former, one current supervisor, have meetings scheduled with two other current supervisors and um, uh, four um, Santa Rosa City Council members and one past City Council member to kind of get their opinions on what they think in terms of representation and where issues have lied and their interactions with the county and some gaps that may exist. Um, so uh, I'm gonna continue to do that and get those uh, opinions. Excellent, Jeff. Thank you. Anna Porto. Hi. Um, I have been reaching out and we continue to reach out to uh, different groups that work with people with developmental disabilities. Great. Thank you all. I don't see any other hands raised, but this is excellent. This type of, of, of outreach that we're doing sort of organically, this is really, um, you know, a step in that right um, the direction of equity, making sure that we're, we're getting all voices heard. Um, I am going to move on to our final agenda item. Apologies, Chair Sheffield. We have one comment, public comment that came oh, through. Oh, yes, I'm question. sorry. Let's, let's, let's go with that. Um, so we have uh, Richard DeLeon, and he <clears throat> says there's a youth group that initially started out of the Equity and in Education Initiative. They are just starting to meet regularly this fall, and anyone could be a guest speaker for the Youth Voices group. That's I did great. reach out to Betsy Chavez, who does oversee it, but I hadn't heard back from her. So if anyone else is in connection with her, that could help bridge that gap. That would That's who the point of contact is. I know Richard and Betsy, so I can communicate with them. I also know Socorro probably knows them too. Great, let's, let's make sure that we do reach out. Okay, thank you, Emily. Um, all right, here we are, last agenda item upcoming meetings. Um, September 1st, this is a optional meeting because it'll be a training on map drawing, encourage folks who are interested in using these tools, maybe getting an understanding of how they use so they can turn around and then teach it out to the rest of the community. Um, again, that is September 1st. It's a four o'clock uh, meeting. I'm assuming it is Zoom. Is that, um, is that correct? Um, and I think yes. at this meeting, Shalisa had also mentioned that it's going to be recorded. So that meeting can also be used as a, as a tool. Um, let's see. Um, we have another meeting, I guess we will schedule via email, make sure we can get on it. This will be this ad hoc committee to focus on equity. Um, and, 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 and then we'll have it brought back to the full commission um, two weeks sometime in early September. We have October 5th, 8.30 a.m., the Board of Supervisors hearing. October 18th, 4 o'clock p.m. will be another meeting of the ARC. Um, and that, that's the four o'clock meeting. Okay. Um, Everything is virtual. I just, <laughs> everything is going to be virtual. That's the way we need to do things. That's the reality. So, um, okay. Is there uh, any last lingering questions um, from folks? Thank, I just want to be, you know, thank our interpreters for staying on this long. Very, very much appreciated. I want to, want to thank all of you commissioners. I want to thank Yvonne. I want to thank Shalise. I want to thank Emily and Linda and Julie, our interpreter, Lorna. Um, I hope that I'm not forgetting anybody. I, this is amazing. This is really important work that we're all doing. Um, uh, Alegria, thank you for staying on. 
Um, and, and Christelle, thank you so much for your insight, your input. Okay, we're gonna close this meeting. It's 844. Hope to see you all soon. Thank you so much. Good night.